I am so excited for this edition of Wingman Conversations. Our guest today is Mr. Bob Kulik. Bob has been a big part of Wingman for, for many years now, and I'm excited to hear a little, more, a little bit more about his story, and I know a lot of what he's doing in the community and around the nation, but Bob has been a, an inspiration to me about what an individual can have, an impact an individual can have on so many people in a very broad sense um, of activities and, and the things that he is doing to impact so many different people. So, Bob, I just thank you for coming on and being on here with us. Um, I just want to hear a little bit more about your story. Tell us a little bit more you know, about your background, where you grew up, kind of from a work-based, what you do for living, jobs, family, whatever Very you want to share. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It, it was <laughs> exciting. Um, well, I grew up in, actually, I was born in New York, of all places, uh, just lo there long enough to be born, and then uh, moved from there, grew up in the Chicago area. So from the time I was uh, three years old till the time I was 19, lived in the Chicago area. Um, grew up really in the church. My father was the president of the congregation several times uh, at a Lutheran church in the Chicago area. Um, I was teaching Sunday school at, uh, in junior high school, and so it was just uh, church was always part of my uh, part of my growing up. Uh, went from there to let's see, well, uh, kind of a uh, sidelight could get into the whole thing. But uh, uh, right after high school, I was part of a team that reenacted La Salle's trip from Montreal to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, spent eight months in canoes and uh, paddling from from Montreal to the Gulf. And um, then after that, went out to Connecticut. I'm gonna stop here. Sure. Share a little bit more. I was so intrigued. <laughs> Dig dive a little bit deeper into this. A bunch of teenage kids mm -hmm. with a high school teacher for how many months? Uh, eight months on the eight trip. Eight months. Yeah. You're in buckskins, leathers, mm -hmm. you know, simulating what somebody did in the 18th, early 18th century. Six, 1681, six, 18. Yeah. 17th century. Yeah. And going up and down, or not up and down, but down the Mississippi River. Okay. Yeah. Stopping at different locations. I mean, you probably didn't. <laughs> it, it was it was a, a little real ripe life changer um yeah oh yeah a little, little ripe but uh we actually spent two years two years preparing for it so we made all the canoes by hand all the uh clothing by hand the moccasins the muskets the paddles everything because uh, we wanted to do it as authentically as they did they had no machinery to make clothing so we actually hand stitched every piece of clothing we wore uh, hand stitch or moccasins, all that stuff. And it was during the bicentennial year. So we left in, in August of 1976. And the teacher that put it together, who's a French teacher at the Crosstown Rival High School in Elgin, Illinois, and uh, he said, so much is being geared toward east to west migration for the bicentennial. He wanted to show north to south migration by the French. So um, La Salle was one that he actually claimed the Mississippi, Mississippi Valley for France, which he called everything from the Alleghenies to the Rockies and from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. So basically a third of the, the country was claimed by him in uh, August of 1681. And um, so, yeah, so we, we spent two years preparing for it, eight months on the trip, and we'd stop in towns along the way, we'd give uh, presentations, we'd sing French voyageur songs, tell them about the, the life of the voyageur, and then sleep out under the canoe and in the morning get up and paddle then to the next town and uh, we actually had the coldest winter in recorded history the year that we did it too uh, we actually had to walk from east chicago indiana 527 miles uh, around the base of lake michigan uh, the st joe river the illinois the entire length of the illinois river down past st louis before we'd get back in and start paddling again so uh, I it was it, my, my parents said he left a boy came back a man <laughs> now i am just totally intrigued by by the accomplishments, what a group of young men did for eight months, and I can honestly see how you left as a boy and came back as a man. But you know, in the spirit of Wingman, the relationships that you were cultivated and nurtured on that trip carried over, you know, in essence, for a lifetime. Right. You got several of you have done several adventure type trips mm -hmm. similar to that over the years. Just yeah. kind of talk two, to that. Two of the guys from the expedition, I mean, we stay in touch with almost all the guys, uh, but two of them uh, and I do a, what we call guys trip. Our wives call it a stupid guys trip. Uh, we're not <laughs> sure if stupid is modifying trip or guys, so we're afraid to ask. But um, yeah, we do some type of trip every year. We've climbed Kilimanjaro. We've raced uh, motorcycles on the Baja 500. We've done shark diving. We've done uh, hiking in Patagonia, um, hike, di bike, kayak through Peru. You name it, just something that's uh, an adventure. And we, we keep saying, 
the year that we say, okay, next year, let's do a pinochle term tournament, we know we'll, we'll be old at that point. <laughs> Until that time, <laughs> we're pushing forward. Keep pushing the throttles <laughs> That's up, right. as they say. That's awesome. But sorry for the gr digression there, but go back to finish I, with oh, what yeah. you were well, saying before. Uh, yeah, so uh, after the expedition, I went to – my parents had moved. I, I always say, you know, they, they left without telling me, but they moved from the Chicago area to Connecticut. I found them and uh, went out there, and I started at University of Connecticut, did a couple of years out there. Uh, they then moved to Colorado. I found them again and uh, <laughs> uh, went out to Colorado, finished it uh, in Fort Collins at Colorado State, and um, then started my restaurant career up in the Denver area. And uh, I'd always worked in restaurants while I, I, I actually did two things while I was in, in school. I put myself through college as a professional speaker, talking about the expedition. So I'd go around to schools and civic groups and all that, and do a slide. Back that uh, in that day, it was a slideshow uh, on the expedition. And really, the the push on it was, you know, at that time, 1976, people were always saying, "Oh, the kids are too too soft today. They can't do what kids of years past could do." That kind of resonates still it today, does, does it not? Exactly. Generational, right? right. So, um, so that's why I was doing it, going around saying, you know, everybody said we couldn't do this, and we went and did it. And um, so part of it was, uh, was going around speaking. The other part was working in restaurants. And uh, so after I finished um, college, I actually, my wife saw an ad in the paper for a place called Casa Bonita, a 55,000-square-foot uh, uh, square foot. Um, restaurant that had cliff divers and all the stuff and she was you just go and, and practice an interview and I went and interviewed with them they liked me I liked them they called me back three times and I ended up being a restaurant manager at Casa Bonita in Denver really <laughs> yeah I yeah. did not know you know that was one of the cool places attending the Air Force Academy in oh, Colorado right. you yeah. take family up there to see these guys jump off a cliffs inside of a building right. at a restaurant yep. yeah and I think the other claim to fame for you younger guys that watch South Park South Park oh right made uh -huh. that famous too yeah. but so I, I, I worked there for a little over a year uh, as a manager, and then they tapped me to go down to the corporate headquarters in the Dallas area. And uh, I became eventually head of purchasing for, um, at, at one time it was Costa Bonita Incorporated, and then we bought a couple of other restaurant chains and became Unigate uh, restaurants. Uh, did that for a number of years. One of the guys who ran two of the, the concepts uh, left and went to a small company in Chicago called Warburton's Bakery Cafe. Uh, and he asked me to come do a turnaround with him up there. And uh, we had thought they had lost $130,000 and $13 million in sales. And I looked at it and said, I can fix that, $130,000 and $13 million, no problem. Got up there. Uh, our first board meeting was telling the board of directors, you have to put more money into this because there was a decimal point error. error. There, the loss was $1.3 million on $13 million in sales, and we're about to go under. <laughs> and uh, So I spent the next three years with a couple of other people turning the, the chain around, got it sold to Au Bon Pain, and uh, worked myself out of a job. And uh, started calling around different people I knew in the industry, and one of the guys was a recruiter, and he said, don't even call anybody else. He said, I've got the perfect match for you, this guy by the name of Joe Croce. He just started this little pizza chain in... Uh, the Dallas area called CC's Pizza, and I'm going to set up an appointment for you to, to meet him. So uh, I flew down to meet Joe, and I was supposed to spend two hours with him. Ended up, he kept saying, can you get a later flight? Can you get a later flight? I ended up spending six hours with him. I flew back up to Chicago and told my wife, he's going to offer me the job, and I'm going to take it. And sure enough, uh, it, it was funny because um, he was just heading off to something else. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you, and I got back. So it took a couple of weeks, and in the meantime, I had gotten a call from another guy who I'd worked with, and uh, he said, I want to meet with you. We sat down and had breakfast, and he said, I've already talked to the board. They want you. What do you want? It's yours. You know, and so I said, well, this guy, Joe Croce, is supposed to be calling me back tomorrow. I said, let me, let me give it some thought, and I, I went back home. It was February. It was snowing, and so Joe called me and said, I want to offer you the job. So I had two job offers, one in Chicago, one in Dallas. It was February. It was snowing. We said, we're going to Dallas. <laughs> move south, young man. Move it south. Was, it That's was the it. best move we could ever make. So, uh, so what year was that? That would have been 1992. Yeah, 92 is when I started with them. So 20, we had 20 restaurants at the time. So you're the reason that the Cowboys started their first Super Bowl win in 92 is because you moved to the area. There that you was go. It. That was I it. I see the connection yeah. now. <laughs> That's perfect. I see the connection now. <laughs> so awesome. But, uh, but, yeah, so uh, when I started, it was Joe Croce, a uh, operations guy, a receptionist, myself in the corporate headquarters, and um, 
don't know how many years later, uh, Joe ended up se- selling me the company and a couple of other guys. And uh, by that time, we were up to about 400 restaurants. We took it to about 600 and sold it again. And uh, I did my five-year stint with a private equity firm. And at the end of my five-year commitment, I said goodbye. And so I've been retired now for six years. So. Uh, we'll get into the <laughs> retirement, retirement, what yes. that means. That, yeah. that I don't think you are ever retired, no, no. Bob. But, <laughs> you know, along that journey... We were, you know, eventually met and we connected, but I, I'm curious as to tell everybody else how you came connected with Wingman. Sure. Um, actually, and it's, it's kind of, it's related to uh, CC's as well, because it was about the time that uh, we purchased the company. And it was really a deal where I was kind of going through a rough time because of things going so well. Um, I was president of the company. I had just purchased a large company that was growing. I was president of my church congregation. I was president of my uh, daughter's uh, cheer booster club. And it's like, I felt like everything I touched was gold. And, you know, things are just good. So I was feeling pretty good about myself. And really, probably, I, not probably, I was uh, more self-focused and more, um, not, not as focused on my family. In fact, I had missed the whole thing. I, my, my wife, Jackie, uh, and I have been married 36 years. I've got two daughters, uh, 32 and uh, 28. Uh, Brittany is traveling the world as an international blogger, been to 57 countries, their older daughter. Our younger daughter, Jennifer, is a, um, uh artist, has her own business uh, in, in Grapevine. One, one lives a block away from us, and one lives on the other side of the world, so uh, you never know. But I... I my focus was less on them and less on the family and less on that and more on myself and how good things were. And a friend of mine, Tom Sno- Thomas Snodder, uh, said, I, at that time I was also on the board of Happy Hill, and um, uh, Thomas called me and said, hey, your, your uh, buddy Ed Shipman that started Happy Hill is going to be speaking at this group called Wingman that I go to. And uh, started by Chad Hennings, the former Dallas Cowboy, and uh, he says, you know, you should come to that. And I came to that the first time, and it was like, this is where I need to be. And that, that was probably, what, 12 years ago? A long time ago. Years ago. Yeah, That's something like that. That's a long time ago. And yeah. uh, so that, that really started my time at Wingman, being invited by – I think as so many guys, that's the way they find it, is being invited by somebody. And uh, You know, that's really you – know, this whole ministry has really, to your point, has grown organically, where it's yeah. based on relationships, friendships, and, and guys out of a need. Um that needed that fellowship. Mm-hmm. And in your case, a lot of guys come to Wingman out of out of pain, out of uh, you know a need of an inability to overcome an issue, whether it's struggling with addiction, with divorce, whatnot. But but you were at a period of life. I want to explore that a little bit further of of success. Right. Was that kind of you know sometimes that that carrot of success dangles any. Thing that you know that you had experienced through through Wingman that you know helped walk through that or any particular moments. The guys at Wingman will keep you humble. <laughs> 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 Say that because uh, there, there's a group there called the I Hate Bob Club. That, uh <laughs> but no, it's it, I, I think it's that guy camaraderie that you really need where you can be real with each other, and you don't get that in church. You don't get that in. Uh, the fam- for the most part, you don't get that in church because it's a, you know it's, there's a lot of that. Um, oh, you know, you, you say the wrong word and everybody stares at you in church. Where in Wingman, that happens sometimes. It's like a bunch of guys together, and you know, we'll say stupid things, we'll do stupid things, and we realize that and slap each other on the head maybe once in a while. But you got to you have permission guys. to be guys exactly to be exactly. a guy to be a guy. Right. So, what element do you belong to? Uh, grapevine. The grapevine so we've guys? actually moved around a little bit. We're sometimes in South Lake now, sometimes in Grapevine, but yeah, we, we call ourselves Grapevine. How long have you been, guys have been together in that oh, group? Geez. If you can, since think. we started the element groups. Yeah, whatever. I mean, that's, that's been, been a while. So, yeah, it's it been has been a while. A while. Yeah. You guys are one of our stalwart groups. Yeah. Yeah. But um, let's dive into this thing that you call retirement. <laughs> um, you have been an impact, in, you know, not only with Wingman, um, but, but in a variety of other ministries. You know, I'll just give you the floor to yeah. kind of tell you what you tell everybody, share with everybody what you do. Well, I, I think kind of an interesting story is the di- dichotomy between why I came to Wingman and why the guy who I ended up getting involved with, one of the pri- one of the mis- ministries I'm involved with, prison ministry, got involved with it. I, I got involved because of success. He got involved because I invited him and invited him over and over again. It was hard to get him to come. 
but he was at the low point of his life. He had actually been uh, sentenced to 10 years in prison and was waiting to get into to prison. And I guess when, when he first started, he was going through the process. He was going uh, at the trial and all that. But like he said, he got scared and he got stupid. He did some stuff that he, he shouldn't have done. Uh, white collar crime, they call it. But he was at the low point of his life. I was at the top <laughs> of my life in a lot of ways. Uh, yet both were driven into to wingman for it. When I uh, when I brought David in, was my friend. Um, I had no idea. I just it was just before I retired and had no idea that I'd get involved with prison ministry. But he he like I said he got in, in some trouble. He by the time he was sent up to prison, he was divorced. Uh, had basically lost everything. Was living in a little apartment. Um, so. When he went up to, to Rochester Federal Prison in, in Minnesota, um, shortly after that, I sent him one of Gene Getz's study Bibles. Um, and that was, I had just gotten it at High Ground Ski Retreat. He had, he had presented it to the guys, I think, a couple of months before that he had just finished this after seven, year, uh, seven years of work on it. So I sent it up to him. Very unique Bible, 1,500 um, life lessons that are embedded throughout the Bible. Sent it up, and a short time later, David sends me a message going, I showed it to a bunch of guys up here. They absolutely love it. Uh, they're saving their money to, to get one themselves. I said, tell them not to save their money. So I sa sent about a dozen up to this group. Uh, they formed a group called the Band of Brothers. Uh, they started studying out of this. We start, Actually, our element group at one time did a year-long study of the Bible. So we did read through the Bible in a year, and I would send them every month, the guys up in prison, our uh, studies for the month, and they would be doing the same study we are. So we could email back and forth questions and things like that. So it's kind of cool making that, that connection. But through a series of coincidences, you know, uh, things just happened one thing after another. I started working with these these guys, mentoring these guys up in prison. Gene Getz asked me to be on his radio show one day to talk about the prison ministry that I had started. Uh, at the end of the interview, uh, we did it was five 15-minute shows, uh, a week-long show. And at the end of it, he says, can you stay around for a minute? And I said, sure. And he said, um, Bob, I want you to be on our board. And I was like, why? Why me? <laughs> I said, he goes, you know, I don't know. Because I had met him like two, three years previously, and I didn't know him that well. But he says, no, I just have a feeling that you're a person we need to have on the board. And I said, well, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. And got back to him and said yes. And... Um, our, my very first board meeting, Gene announced, uh, I've, I've just been asked by my uh, publisher to rewrite Measure of Man specifically for pris prisoners to do a prison study for them. And here I am, having spent about a year working with these guys in prison, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so he was writing it for a group called Awana Lifeline that does a, a, a prison ministry. So again, through this series of things, Gene and Awana got Awana Lifeline got linked up together. He was supposed to go present study Bibles to a group of guys, 120 guys that were graduating from Angola Prison in Louisiana um, after they had done the Malachi Dad's study group that he had written this, this study guide for. And he called me one day and said, Bob, tell me you can go down to Angola Prison. We're presenting 125 study Bibles to these guys that just graduated. Um, we're going to be able to speak to there's supposed to be 2,000 people there seeing what's going on at this prison and I was tell me you can go and I looked at my schedule and I said it's right in between trips I can go he says great because I can't you're filling in for me <laughs> 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 I learned a lot from Gene Getz <laughs> um, so I went down there presented these study Bibles and got a chance to explain uh, what what the study Bible was and kind of explain the Malachi dads to a group of there that was down there and the one lifeline guys asked me to be on their board of directors too and they, they had first checked it with Gene. They asked if he, w he was okay with it. He said yes. So I've become kind of a, an interesting conduit between these two ministries. So Awana Lifeline does prison ministries for men and women, Malachi Dads for men, Hannah's Gifts for women, teach them how to be, how to be good parents, Ta teach them first, you know, all the things that we grew up knowing in church. You know, what does sanctification mean? What does salvation mean? What does baptism mean? We, th we have a tendency to throw around those words. Inmates sometimes have never heard those before. And if a religious group comes in and starts talking to them, they start throwing around these words, they're like, I don't even know what that means. So they end up leaving. The Malachi Dads program, the Handy Skiff program, explains to them first what that means, what all those words mean, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to uh, be saved. Uh, and then it takes them through two books uh, f based on Gene's Measure of Man, what does it mean to be a man or a woman of integrity? 
and then from there it takes them through family reconciliation what does it mean to be a good parent and I, I've met some of the best parents I've met are inmates some of them with life terms in prison so that's how I'm spending and you can probably tell my enthusiasm for it I, yeah, I get excited it by it doesn't show it because all, right? it, you know it, you see the the changes that goes on because I always tell people in prison it's usually either God or gangs and they're looking for something they're at the bottom of of their life in a lot of cases so they're looking for something to be a part of gangs are very quick to to pull them in if we can get to them first um there's some i've got a guy that's uh in his third year of seminary right now up in rochester federal medical prison um he ran the largest street gang in chicago the black disciples um if you saw him on a street even at your size you'd probably cross the street i mean this guy's a big guy dreadlocks First time I, I saw I met him after I'd gotten him started in seminary and all this, he came up to me, grabbed my hands in both of his, and says, Bob, thank you so much for what you're doing. He says, uh, I want to, when I get out, I want to be a leader again. I just want to be a different type of leader this time. And here's a guy that, I mean, no telling the things he did as black disciples, <laughs> you know, head of the black disciples, and now he's got that street cred, and he's going to go back in there with a seminary degree. You know, can you imagine what he can do for the kingdom? You know, it's, it's interesting just how God weaves this tapestry yeah. and just your whole testimony, how one thing, next step led to the next step, led mm -hmm. to the next step. And you were obedient. So mm -hmm. thank you for hearing the voice of God and, and for stepping, you know, right. let it be me in, in impacting the lives of so many folks. And what you're doing now with the uh, Malachi Dads <coughs> program and, and Hannah's gift um, through Awana God is kicking down a few doors here too. You're getting into federal prisons, this right. whole separation of church and state, but but the biggest test case has been Angola prison. Tell mm -hmm. a little bit about, you know, just briefly the history of that prison, but how God totally changed it and how it is, you know, those lessons learned are impacting, you know, other prison systems right. around the country. Right, well, it, it's really interesting because you, you look at things from a human perspective and say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. And you look at it from a God perspective afterwards and go oh okay that's <laughs> right so angola prison was 22 years ago was known as the bloodiest prison in the country um on average they had a stabbing a day a murder every three days and a third of the prison population were sex slaves uh um burl kane came in about 22 years ago as the uh, new warden he looked at it and said this place is a mess and the only thing that i know that can change things is moral rehabilitation the only thing I know that change, changes morals is the Bible. And so he started looking at it from that perspective and started talking to some of the inmates and saying, you know, how can we change this? What can we do? He found that the biggest concern that the inmates had, even though, you know, there were so many murders and things like that going on, the biggest concern they had was their kids would follow them into, into prison. So he didn't know what to do with that. He knew that Awana dealt with kids. And so he called Awana in Chicago and said, can you help me? I don't know what to do. Can you help me? And so Awana Lifeline was born out of that. From that, it went from uh, Awana Lifeline starting to change hearts in there to eventually got to a point where they started a seminary in Angola Prison. So there's a full four-year, uh, it's the New Orleans Theological Seminary that started it down there. So full professors are teaching inmates. They, the average uh, sentence in Angola is 93 years. So it gives you an idea <laughs> how long those guys are in there. So these guys with long-term uh, or life sentences can go in there, get a full four-year degree. After they graduate, they go out to the other prisons in Louisiana as field ministers. So they're... Uh, so sending missionaries. Missionaries, yeah. So full-time, 24-7 inmates that are going to be there as missionaries. Uh, several years ago, one of the guys on the uh, Louisiana prison board came after Burl Kane, started throwing accusations about him of misusing funds, um, all kinds of things that just one thing after another, as they came up, Burl was able to show that every one was not true. Uh, but eventually they were just so, there were so many coming that he said, I'm gonna retire. I, this isn't good for the system, it isn't good for my family. Uh, so he retired. So that's the thing that we look at and go, oh my gosh, it's terrible. After all the great things Burl did in this prison, now to retire. God's perspective was Louisiana is this little tiny state. Uh, we can now take him out of that and start the same thing in Texas, which is known. Well, I, I, I do my uh, daughter and I both do a lot of world travel, and we were talking about that. We just got back recently from Vietnam, and we were saying it's so funny because when people travel around the world, they say, "Oh, where you're from?" People say England or 
uh, Australia or whatever, when they come to, to people from the United States, they say, come from America, come from the United States. When they come to Texans, they say, I'm from Texas. Everybody knows Texas. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's natural to say that. And so the, the uh, seminary that got started in Angola prison down there, next he started in Texas. And so Darrington prison uh, south of, of Houston has a full year, a uh, full four-year seminary down in it. Same thing is going on in Texas now. Now it's been four years that uh, we've just had our fourth graduating class down there. Every uh, maximum security prison in Texas has field ministers in it now, and the wardens are saying it's totally changing the culture. So there, there's one warden we talked to. He said, I have 26 um, dorms within my prison. Today, after two years of having field ministers in them, 24 of the 26 have prayer circles every night. And so it's just, it, it changes it totally. And um, so that started there. Plus, Burl has gone on now to, uh, it's Global Global Prison Seminaries, I think is the name of his foundation. So he goes all around the United States, all around the world, planting these as well. We've got them starting in New Mexico, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, the Carolinas, uh, just all over the place. And so you look at what, what man sees as bad, God sees as an opportunity, and that opportunity is being seized. Yeah, I'm just, again, I'm intrigued how, how one individual can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I want to kind of wrap this up. You know, if there are any wingmen out there or anybody that's not a wingman wants to learn more about what you're doing or this inspires them to do something, you know, how, how can they get in contact with you? Well, um, we, uh, Awana Lifeline is going through some changes right now. Awana is spinning off, uh, spinning us off as its own, uh, basically they, they birthed us, and now it's time for us to stand on our own. So uh, awanalifeline.org is right now and has been our, our um, website. It's changing over to lifelineglobal.org. So if go, people go on there, they can, they can see what we're all about. Lifelineglobal.org. Yeah. Right. right. And um, so, yeah, they can, they can learn about us and come around. And I always tell people, come to prison with me. Come you to know, prison. I, when you have taken several wingmen I have. on different trips yeah. to, to prisons. Yeah. That's and people are, a lot of times are nervous about it. And I always tell people, just come once. And if you never want to come again, I'll never mention it to you again. But nine times out of ten, you're going to want to say. And a good friend of ours, Steve Weinberg, yeah. first time I took him, he was nervous about it. I had to literally drag him out of there. Uh, after uh, the end of it, and as soon as we walked out the last gate, he turned to me and said, when can I come back? And so it's, like I say, it's fertile ground there. That's awesome. That is awesome. <coughs> now, just in closing, if I'll give you an opportunity to, to share with the wingman anything that is on your heart, um, I'll just open sure. format, whatever you'd like well, to share with them. I, I would say, really, if you look at it from you know, a perspective of why I came to Wingman. I was kind of at the height of my career. Things were going well for me. And sometimes you take a look at that and go, when things are going the best for you, you start losing your perspective on what's the most important to you. Um, so if things are going really well for you, come to Wingman. You need a group around you. You need a group of really strong, Christ-centered men to keep you humble and let you know what's the most important. If, on the other hand, you're at the low part, part, of, part of your life, like my friend David was, um, he struggled for months with coming. He kept, he kept telling me, he, when he finally did come, he kept telling me the reason I didn't come was I thought it was a bunch of um, rich businessmen. They were all sitting around, and I was not part of that anymore. <coughs> I had changed too much. I'm now on my way to prison. Once he came, he's like, this is where I belong. This is they, these men rallied around me. So if you're at the top of your life, come to Wingman. You need a group of men. If you're at the bottom of your life, come to Wingman. You need a group of men. If you're in that center section, come to Wingman because you're going to be in one one position or the other as time goes on. You never stay stagnant. Well, I appreciate that, Bob. Again, thank you so much thank for you. what you do and, and for allowing God to utilize your life. And I know you're an inspiration for the guys that have kind of heard your story. Mm -hmm about the impact that one guy can have. What well, a life of adventure. You. Thank you, because you've, you've given this format to an awful lot of guys, and it's grown for, from the 13 years or whatever that I've seen. It's done some tremendous things in men's life. So thank you for thank you. what you're Thank doing. you, Bob. Sure. And guys, just want to say, again, God has placed a, a, a seed in your heart to impact the community for the greater good. Find a wingman, get together, and go out and execute the mission. Until next time, take care. God bless.